Okay, so this morning we pick up in the book of Galatians again. Surprise, surprise. Uh, we pick up in Galatians 3, and we'll be in verses 15 to 18 will be the, the primary focus for today. Um, last week, um, let's start with this bigger thing. Uh, just before we dig in like we want to do every week. We want to make sure we're framing the context. Before we jump in in the middle of a, a block of text, we want to get our mind around what's going on. Okay, and We don't ever want to forget that, and so we just want to be able to speak that out. So what's going on in the book of Galatians that, that we have this letter that we're reading? Galatians what? Uh, we're in Galatians 3 right now. Paul's received a message from the Lord, and he's not only gone to make sure that they're all on the same page, but he's also gone to uh, rebuke rebuke them for trying to make the gospel something more than it is. (coughs) Amen. Amen. Right on. So we have this letter to Galatia. Galatia is a region of a bunch of churches. Uh, we have this letter that's written to them, um, exactly like Kate, what Katie's saying is that uh, Paul's gotten word that he, he went and shared the gospel in Galatia and this region, all these churches. Um, and as he's left these churches, he's gotten word back that a group of people called the Judaizers, okay, that they've moved into this region. And they started teaching a, another gospel, which he says in Galatians 1 6 is really not another gospel. He says, I'm, I'm amazed how quickly you've left the gospel. Um, Very, very powerful uh, statement. But they've they've come in and they said, hey, you know, yes, it's Jesus. Yes, you have to have Jesus, but you also have to follow the law. It's it's, You must have both in order to have salvation. And for Paul, he's he's very adamant. He spends his whole letter um, writing and talking about how the gospel um, is Christ alone and that salvation comes through Christ alone, period. Um, there's nothing else that you can add to the gospel or take away from the gospel that's going to equal salvation. Um, and so he spends all this time just really just going off about this idea that you're saved through Christ alone, through faith alone, um, period. That's it. Um, uh, and so as, as he processes through this letter, he, he talks about different things that are going on that all, all point to prove in his case um, that, you know, that very point that, the, the gospels through Christ alone, and so last week as we as we looked, and even the week a couple weeks before that, we start walking through uh, Galatians chapter three. A lot of it, uh, for the most part, it's all going to be about the law and him just really focusing in, focusing in on uh, the law's place, um, as opposed, to, you know, in, in opposition to having to have the law plus Christ. He's he's really trying to make a case for the law um, and, and where it belongs. Okay. So we pick up in Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, and that's where we're going to be at today. So if you've got your Bible, you can follow along. Galatians 3, 15 to 18 reads, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So we read through that, and most often you're reading through something like that at home, you're like, <laughs> man, that's like a lot of stuff. I barely know what he just said, but I'm just going to keep reading because uh, that's a lot to try and process. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for you, that's where we're at this week. So we're going to take some time. We want to kind of walk through what is he saying and why is he saying it because it's really powerful. What is what is the point that he's making? So, I'm going to do what we do every week. We're going to walk through these verses, a verse at a time, and really just kind of get our minds around, and even kind of frame some stuff from the Old Testament. Uh, some you know, just kind of get some thoughts stirring for you guys, 
um, help you stand firmer where you're at in this new covenant that we have right now. So verse 15, it begins and it says, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, what are some things that we see in that or that stand out to us? So he's saying that God's promise um, has been established and cannot be just thrown out and added to or changed. That's right. It is. Amen. Yeah, That's right on. That's right on. Irrevocable. Right. There you go. There you go. There you go. Um, maybe does anybody have a different translation that they want to share too? I just want to put it there. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Brothers, let me give you an example. Think about an agreement that a person makes with another person. After that agreement is accepted by both people, <clears throat> no one can stop that agreement or add anything to it. God promises, God made promises to Abraham and his descendants. God did not say, and to your descendant, descendants, that would mean many people. But God said, and to your descendants, that means only one person. That person is Christ. This is what I mean. God had an agreement with Abraham and promised to keep it. The law, which came 430 years later, cannot change God's promise to Abraham. Can following the law give us what God promised? No. If this is so, it is not God's promise that brings us the blessings. Instead, God freely gave us gave his son blessings to Abraham through the promise he had made. Amen. I mean, that, and that does kind of bring a little clarity to it, I, I feel like. Um, what are some things, some other things that we see in there? Like, what is it, what's his whole idea? What's his argument? What's he, what's he, what else is he saying? Well, he's, he, I, I believe that he's making a distinction between when God made the promise to Abraham, he wasn't saying that, you, you know, all the all your children are going to be blessed. He was saying that, that although they will be, it, but it's because of Christ Jesus. So it's... Mm-hmm. It's not the law. It's what would happen through Christ Jesus, which is a descendant of Abraham. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amen. I don't know. Like he's talking about what has been ratified. That's Christ. That's the ratification. So the issue at this point is the Judaizers. These, you know, they're learning about Christ over here. They're they're seeking the spirit. They're getting it, and then here they come. Well, you got to have that. But there's the law, and there's you got to do this too. So in this one statement, uh, where did it go? You, no one sets it aside or adds anything to it. Y'all pay attention. They're adding to it. It doesn't take that plus this. It takes <clears throat> this only. <clears throat> I get it as a, uh, a human example would be um, when we were doing the roofs on the, the chapel. Everybody was bidding um, this amount. Um, and not gutters. Curtis was doing the gutters for for like this much more, um, so we had to ratify. We we made a, a an adjustment. Curtis do this, and then we'll, we'll push it through, and then you get the gutters. It's a contract that they we made um, with Curtis to get the job, and, and it was he agreed on it, we agreed on it, and that's where it was, and that's wow. and that's what they were they were doing back then. They were trying to. He was trying to show example. Even even we won't go against that once we've made that contract. Mm-hmm. And that's a man-made contract, not a God contract. Mm-hmm. He didn't give that covenant. We didn't have a covenant between. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's what he's. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Much that's, more so, he never turns back on us. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's. It's. Yeah. I think about that when things get hard. That I know what he's promised me, and so what this situation looks like. That's. Not the reality because he's already promised me this. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I mean a lot of a lot of truth is there, and even it's the exact like what what everyone's saying. Jason, uh, my mind went blank. Jason, uh, and we'll get, you know just the, mm-hmm. the overall arching thought that's there is like you know even even think about it like this. Uh, I have a will of what I want to happen when I die, and I die. After I die, my will and the things that I have lined up, that's set in stone. You don't go after I die, take my will and say, oh, no, we disagree with that. We're going to change it. We're going we're to do all this other stuff. It's this idea of this, even, even from a man's point of view. Let me give you this human example. 
you something that you know you would agree to that's set in stone that you don't go and change that later um, and that's the case that he's building and that he's setting forth is that you know when God says something when God makes a promise just like you were talking about you know speaking out those promises when God said, makes a promise he's not a man that he would lie scripture says that's right um, his promises they are set in stone <laughs> Not even just the gospel, which we're focused on right now, is the gospel. But any of his promises that he has, they're set in stone. And he proves that in the Old Testament. He sees you walk through the Old Testament. He says this is what's going to happen if you disobey. That's what happens. And he, he speaks, if you, if you follow me, I'll bless you. And that happens. It's, okay, i got to share this. God knows our problems. Mm-hmm. God is the author of our life. He knows he knows all the issues we're going to deal with until he, he takes us home. God doesn't want to hear us us sharing our problems with him. God wants to hear us sharing his promises with him. He wants to hear us speak his promises to him in prayer. I think so many of us spend all of our time, if we're honest, we spend all our time talking about the problems. We don't spend the time that we should be spending talking about the promises. God knows your problems. Just spending the time just sharing with you what your problems is isn't isn't you're never spending the time sharing the promises. God God wants us to speak his promises back to him. You speak his words back to him. That's what makes him move. That's that's a hundred percent what what's going on right here is Abraham to his offspring. That is Jesus. Jesus was the promise. To Abraham, your your uh, lineage is going to save the whole world, and that's. And, and at one point, God in, in in another book where Abraham is actually starts reminding God. If you remember, God was going to judge, and God stopped His judgment because Abraham reminded him of what He said. Mm-hmm. And, and even just a point, just to go even a little bit further with that, is that. When we spend time in His Word, so that allows us to be able to know those promises. That's right. We have to spend that time in His Word, and as we spend time in His Word, it builds that relationship. Um, so there's a there's a whole lot that plays into that to that idea. Um, so uh, brethren, um, don't want to miss that. He starts off that word brothers, brethren, brothers and sisters, whatever translation you have. Uh, that's a term of endearment for Paul. Um, so as he speaks out what he's fixing to say, he's, he's fixing to speak something that he's really wanting to communicate. He wants his listeners to really grasp. Um, so there's weight. You know, kind of as you read, you might think, oh, man, what he's fixing to say means a lot to him. He's fixing to speak it. Um, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it's only, only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Um, I think he's going back here to show them, okay, because the Judaizers are kind of, hey, you need this law also with Christ. But he's going back here and saying, look, even God didn't change anything mm-hmm. right here. Yeah. Um, and that's a good mm-hmm. good point. Um, Which was before the law was given. Yeah, yeah. So um, in the Old Testament, um, Old Testament means Old Covenant, New Testament is New Covenant. Um, in the Old Testament, there's not just one covenant that's made. Um, some people don't don't really realize that um, there's actually several covenants that are made throughout the Old Testament, and they all build on each other as they as the Lord walks through. And we have the history of God uh, revealed in the Old Testament. Um, there's a covenant with Adam. That's the first covenant. There's a covenant that God makes with Noah. Um, that's the second covenant. Uh, there's a covenant that God makes with Abraham. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Um, there's a covenant that God makes Moses. with Moses. Mm-hmm. And it's called the Mosaic Covenant or the Sinaitic Covenant because it's made in Mount Sinai. Um, God makes a covenant with King David. It's called the Davidic Covenant. And then there's also the New Covenant that's in Jeremiah 31 that points to Christ. Um, so there's a series. And each one of those, um, God does it as he which makes... Was, I'm sorry, but which was an unconditional covenant. For It was the first time it was a truly unconditional covenant. Yeah. With Jesus Christ, Amen. Um, and as as each one of these things is built on, 
um, just like what he's talking about here. You, you know, when God makes a promise and he's, he makes these covenants, and they, when you walk through and see this progression, uh, he doesn't nullify uh, things that he spoke and that he promised before. Um, so it's really, as you read through the history of the Old Testament, you see how God reveals himself and how he works, and it's powerful. Um, and that's the, the point that Paul's making here is that, you know, you're, you're stuck here, in, you know, on the law, uh, but you're negating all these other things. So um, now, uh, verse 16 says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. Um, different translations, like uh, Leah was reading a second ago, talking about descendants um, versus descendant. Um, so what, what are some thoughts that we have there? What are some things that stand out to us, come to mind? That's a great thing to be able to say. Well, I want to go look at that. I want to go see where that's at. So he, Sheila he makes. I, I can't find it yet. He makes a promise in Genesis twelve that says, "People who curse you will be cursed, and people who bless you will be blessed." But that's a personal promise to Abraham himself. Okay. That is right. To the nation of Israel. Okay. Let's and do it's this. A second person, like I'm talking to you. Let's go back and let's read some certain passages that all there's not there isn't a place that specifically um, references what one specific thing. So uh, we're going to go kind of read a couple different passages where God, uh, God when He makes His covenant with Abraham, um, it's it's a uh, it's kind of an ongoing type of covenant where it happens throughout several different passages and it's kind of being. I want to say added to, uh, but God speaks and says, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. Uh, so first, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Somebody gets there, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, let's read that. Yeah, go for it. Then the Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives and your family, your father's family, go to the land, I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I will place a curse on those who harm you. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Okay. So here in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, uh, we read a couple things. He, this is something he's specifically speaking to Abraham. Um, but as we read these words, he says a couple things we can really key in on. Um, the whole world will be blessed through you. Um, and just something you can just, just kind of chew on this as we read all of these things, just this really help you keep it in context, is, um, you know, Abraham's looked at as the father of the Israelite nation, of the Jewish right. nation. Um, is um, the whole world blessed through Abraham if he's only the father of the Jewish nation and there's no Jesus? Is the whole world blessed because of him? Uh, it says, uh, "It says all people of the earth will be blessed." Through that's right. Meaning, um, all those who are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's, it says, and, and that's what it points to is towards Jesus. But here we just have a. He's just he's he's alluding to something that's going to happen. But just for me, is I'm just this is how I process it. Okay, that's all. I'm not saying this is anything other than just how I process it. But as I'm processing through these promises that he's making and that what this covenant looks like, I go back to and I just kind of chew on the idea if. If it's only if it's no if there's no Jesus and it's only the people of Israel that come from Abraham, what does that look like to bless the whole world um, because of that? To me, there's got to be something that happens that that truly allows for blessing to come um, through him. And, you know, for me, I, there's no doubt. I believe it's all pointing towards Jesus. But those are questions that I process in my mind as I'm reading through Genesis one, you know, twelve one through three, um, and same with all these other passages. So let's turn to Genesis thirteen. Uh, read verses 14 to 16. So anybody wants to read it? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Somebody speak up. 14 through 15, right? Uh, 14 through 13, 14 through 16. Oh, gotcha. After Lot was gone, the Lord said to Abraham, Look as far as you can see in every direction. I'm going to give all this land to you and your offspring 
as a permanent possession. And I am going to give you so many descendants that, like dust, they cannot be counted. Okay. So for me, as I process through that, which is another part that's leading up towards this covenant, you got a thought? So I'm on, on, on verse 15, it says, For I will give you and your offspring forever on the land that you see. Okay. So, um, I, and something I forgot to mention a second ago, but we'll mention this in a second. Um, so as, I, as, you, as you sit there and think about that, he's saying uh, the same as we'll look at in a minute when he talks about stars. But here he says dust. Uh, I'm gonna, you'll have so many descendants that will be like the dust, you won't be able to count it. Um, right now, even today, as you look at the nation of Israel and what that looks like, there's not so many descendants that it's like dust that you can't count. Or it's like the stars, when you look up to the sky, you can't count them. And that's the problem. That's what God speaks out of his mouth, is that there'll be so many descendants, so many, there'll be just this enormous multitude, not be confined to a nation, so in my mind is that process, not, not, not going to be confined to just a nation or a people group, but to an entire, uh, something much larger, okay? So just, just as you kind of read that, it's kind of, I'm just sharing you with some thoughts that I have. Another thing that I want to key in on, in our translations, as we read it, um, everyone, everywhere that you see the word descendants, you see that in your offspring, you see that in there? Does anybody have like a little number one before that? Okay. So, so maybe some little uh, sub superscript, some, somewhere around that word offspring or descendants. Um, if, if you have a plural word in there like descendants, um, then most likely you're going to have a little superscript one in there uh, because the word that's really used in the Hebrew is the word seed. Um, just the word seed. Um, when we translate it into English, we've translated offspring, we, we translated descendants, uh, we pluralize it. Uh, but that's that's kind of the, what the argument that Paul has. Because when he's in, you got to go back, we're, we're, we're wanting to keep in context in Galatians. He says to, he says to seed, not to seeds. Um, so his argument in, in, in Galatians goes back to this idea that when you're looking at it in the Hebrew, and even as it was translated in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's this idea of this singular, singular word, seed, just... And even in the word seed, there's a plurality that's there. Right. But for Paul, as he's he's looking to to pull out the deeper meaning that's there, um, it's this idea of a singular, singular seed that's intended in Christ. And so I just want to kind of point that out. If you got that superscript, you might you know you want to key in on something like that. Uh, nothing that I want to kind of go ahead. So in Hebrew, it's singular. It's the word. It's I will. It comes down to. Uh, uh, you can translate seed plurally. You can translate seed singularly. Um, and so scholars, even like even when you go to try and look at these words, they they kind of go back and forth on: is it a plural word? Is it a singular word? So it's like so, English. So seed is seed. So seed, 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 right. Offspring could be one or, or many. Or, or many. Right. And so what? So what's translated singular? Yeah, and so what? What Paul's doing, and this is what's really powerful yeah, it's got, about it's scripture. Got to be consistent with the other yeah. verses around it. Exactly. Um, but what's incredible is that all through Scripture, um, when there's prophecy that's given, and even this is in form of prophecy, um, it always have a meaning. And when you read through Scripture, and you'll see a prophecy, I won't say always, almost always, ninety eight percent of the time. There's a meaning that's that's for the people, that people group right then. There's something that's applicable to them. But there's also scripture that God says, while there's a meaning for this people group right now, there's also a meaning that's a, a deeper prophecy, if you will, that's fulfilled later through Christ. Um, so, so you know, yeah. Well, it's just an example. They're God's example for us. Hey, okay, that's good. Uh, in this right here, yeah. Abraham, he's going to have a lot of, of descendants, you know, and, and the world's going to be blessed uh, through everything that happens with Israel. And if you can look at it in a sense and say the world was blessed in a sense through Israel, through things that they did, through, uh, you know, just the story of Israel, the, the interaction that happened with people. Um, I have a key word in here. Um, it says God's gift was not given to Abraham personally, but was given to him in trust as the founder and representative of the nation. So that, to me, means that he's he's not uh, he's not giving it to Abraham, but Abraham's offspring, yeah. which is Jesus. Christ. Yeah, which is Jesus. Yes. Because in sixteen, mine says, 
descendant singular, and at the end of the verse it says also you can, if anyone can count dust of the earth, also you can count your descendants, plural. Right, so it's both. He's saying so I'm giving both. it to the descendant singular of Jesus Christ, who's going to come through Abraham's bloodline yeah. on the earth. Yeah. But at the very same time, he's blessing all the people of the earth that are going to come through Jesus Christ. He's doing it's both. Amen. Amen. And so, so, uh, so as we as we look at Scripture, not to just and isn't it awesome how he chooses C? Because yeah. seed is both; it's singular and plural. Amen. Yeah, one, one even in offspring. our language, it's singular and plural. Much of the I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, <coughs> so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Amen. And, and I want to throw this out here too, uh, and, I, and I'm going to try and get off into a bunch of rabbits and chasing, you know, trails and all this stuff. But really, guys, like what we're doing here, looking at this scripture and really being able to look at this, um, it's really, really important that, w- that you take time to study passages that are hard because people will come against you with a scripture like this. Well, it says, he says seed, but when you right. look at Genesis, it's plural, so it, it contradicts itself. Um, people will, will make arguments like that. I mean, so it's important to spend time, get your mind around to build a process because Scripture doesn't contradict itself. And as you process through, you can see the deeper meaning that's there, and it's, and it's powerful. It comes alive. So um, anyway, I'll look at a couple more verses in Genesis as, just as we, as we process through what this looks like. Uh, Genesis 15, verses uh, 4 through 6. So I guess when you eat, you eat Z. <laughs> Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. There you go. And Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Amen. And so then, too, when you see the word descendants there, you probably have a superscript there. It, well, and mine, mine adds to, it says, too many to count. Too many to count, yeah. Meaning, look up the stars if you can count them. And the point is, you can't. Mm-hmm. There's too many to count. Mm-hmm. Amen. And also, look at the sky, you see the stars you can only see. They're still around the globe, you can't. Amen. Amen. That's good. Um, uh, and, and and right there too, as um, in, in fifteen, as you keep reading, that's actually where God actually makes the actual covenant with him. Um, they sacrifice animals. Um, it's all right there. I just want to throw that out there. Uh, that, that's where he got circumcised too, right? Yeah, right after Which all that. Kind of goes into the Judaizer saying, yep. hey, "You need to do this." That's right. Too. That's right. Um, Seventeen one through eight. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Somebody gets that, they can read that. Not everybody all at once, though. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham, Abram, sorry, and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of the multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Amen. So a couple just things just to process through, like I was saying earlier, is that uh, for, you know, just on the ideas of uh, he's, the, he's the father of the Israel nation, the nation of Israel, the Jewish nation, but here God says, I'm going to make you the, the father of a multitude of nations. Uh, and so 
Um, you know, I, I would not look at, you know, even if I had partially Jewish, you know, uh, ancestry or something, I wouldn't be looking at him as my father. Um, but uh, bigger picture is that it's pointing towards um, the, the, the family that we're grafted into because of the line of Abraham, I'm, which leads to the line of Christ. I'm curious to know Danny in 7 if he uses the word seed in Hebrew. Again. Yes, everywhere you see the word <laughs> yeah. descendants in there, so you, should, if you have, if you have a... singular in 7. Yeah. Uh, any word that you have that, that word descendants in... Uh, it can be singular. In 7 and in 8. Seven. Both. Will, between me and your seed you, forever. It says, I will establish my pact with you and your descendant, singular, as a perpetual pact for all generations. Everywhere in that passage is the word seed. I will be your God and the God of your descendants, plural. But to be father of more than one nation, as he just said two sentences before, that can't be a singular seed. Well, but... He's making the pact with starts with him and a singular descendant. So he's talking about Christ again. Yes. So, uh, and then finally, just one last little passage to look at Genesis as we look at this last one. Uh, Genesis 18, verses 17 to 18. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. All right, so just, just a little, you know, kind of addition just for us to kind of look at there where he says again this idea that through Abraham all these nations will be blessed um, and so just as you take all those just kind of all together as we as you kind of trace through Abraham um, and, and the things that God spoke and the things that God promised to him that's what you know as Paul's writing it back in Galatians back in context for Galatians he's kind of taking all these different events and kind of just you know kind of putting them all together to speak and say that there's a fulfillment in all these promises that were given to Abraham that come through the seed of Christ and that you can't nullify this promise that was made to Abraham because of the law. See, in, in 19, it says, For I have chosen him, so he will command his children and house after him to the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill uh, Abraham what he promised him. Amen. Right, right. I mean, right here, he's actually talking about Sodom. No, he's talking. Well, he's God's asking. That's why he starts out. Should I hide my plan for Abraham? Because he's getting ready to judge Sodom. Oh, no. But not to get off too much in the weeds and all that. I just want to. Yeah, yeah. I just want to kind of. I wanted y'all to be able to put your eyes. It's great. Yeah, great that Sheila brought that up to be able to look back at this promise because if if he's talking about a promise. Then, like we've done other weeks, you want to go back and look at that so that you're putting your eyes with, you know, putting your eyeballs on. Like, if he said, what's he saying? I want to go back and look at it. I want to understand that in context. If he's going to quote it, I want to get my mind around what he's quoting. Um, and so, really good to be able to go back and look at that. There was weed simpler plural. All right. So, um, all right. So, so. Anything else on that? I mean, I think we've pretty much kind of covered all that. Uh, verse 17 says, What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. So we've kind of already kind of hit on this a little bit, but just any thoughts as we read what he says here, any thoughts that, that stir up in us? I believe he's given a, a clue that the law was given to show the people their sin. Mm-hmm. Meaning that the covenant was made through Abraham, which would be through Christ, which supersedes the law that would come later. Mm -hmm. And I believe he's given them a hint. He's given all of us a hint. Uh, again, to testify to us, well, when people ask, well, why did he give the law? He gave the law to show them their sin. Mm -hmm. Which we won't get into that in depth today. Right. But next week, spot on he's going to because after he, after he kind of closes today we're going to kind of be left with like well what's the point of the law I mean really that's kind of like after we get in today it's going to be like what's the point of the law next week he starts to say why the law then that's the very so he starts off the next verse that we'll look at verse 19 next week why the law then um, and so we'll kind of I walk through reading your notes, yeah. I promise uh, that's right. <laughs> uh, but that's kind of what he's walking into but yeah he's he's um, 
he is he's he's really trying to drive home this idea that um, you can't just go off the law right here when there was this promise before, um, and so he's he's walking through that. So, any other thoughts? Anything else that we kind of see there? What he's bringing to my mind is that salvation can't be lost. Like Curtis was asking me about my dad's salvation, that even if there's not fruit, if there was a night that he cried out to him in faith, maybe he's fallen quite a bit. But I have faith that he had faith in his moment of need, Mm -hmm. and he knows where he's going. Um, anything else that we see there? Anything else anybody wants to share? Um, verse uh, 18 uh, we'll wrap up with this as oh, well. I'm sorry Dan, but just to make sure I, we did, did cover that he, I, he's also saying that the law did not supersede the covenant That's right. he's saying 430 years later when God gave the law it didn't supersede the covenant God had already made mm-hmm yeah, hundred percent, and and even and even he keys in on this idea of four hundred and thirty years later. This thing happened later that you're focused on, but it doesn't take away from this. Just like the covenant that he made afterward with David, and the new covenant that he 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 testifies to in Jeremiah thirty one, those don't do away with the law. It, you know, it doesn't as you go along. Okay, well now we got this one, we're going to forget about this one. Now we got this, we're going to forget about this. Now we got this, we're going to forget about all this. They build on each other as they go through, and that's what you know. He's he's saying, you know, you're focused on this 430 years later, but it doesn't take away from this promise that's right here. That's a good point. Um, verse 18 says, "For if the inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise." Um, just any thoughts there? Just anything that comes to mind? <coughs> My, my translation reads a little bit different. Okay. It's for the for if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Amen. Okay. So any any more thoughts there? Anything that kind of stands out to us? It was freely given. I think he's trying to make a point. You either base it on the law or you base it on the promise. You can't have two bases for the same thing. That's exactly what he's, he's sitting there speaking out, is that you can't have it both ways. It's either the promise or it's the law. Which one are you going to pick? Um, and so, and then that's why next week he says, why the law then? Because he's going to start really going into what the point of the law <coughs> is uh, for us. But for today, as we as we stop here at verse 18, he's just really trying to drive home this idea that um, that it's a gift that was given. And even the word that's, that's talking about that it's given, um, the Greek word that's there, it's an incredible word that, that it incorporates this idea of grace that's there. Uh, you know, yeah, exactly. Um, this idea of grace that as it's given and it's this perfect, uh, perfect gift that's given. Um, so just really, just really, really uh, good stuff that's there. Um, but you can't have it both ways. And, and that's what he's really trying to drive home. And so for us today, as we sit here and we really process through and we sit here and you know, we can sit here and look at all this. Uh, we can be thankful today for the relationship that we have with Christ Jesus. That it's through Christ alone. Um, that it, there's no no other strings attached. Um, doesn't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter how bad you are. Doesn't matter how much bad stuff you've done. Doesn't matter how much good stuff you've done. It's not based on any of your works. We have a relationship and we have salvation through Christ alone. Because God sent His Son to this earth as the ultimate payment for our sin. Um, and that's something to just really praise the Lord for and be thankful for. So as we go into church today, it's something to you know just be able to ruminate in and just be able to to just be thankful for. Um, and then next week, as we look at Scripture, we'll we'll look at the purpose of the law, which also is going to cause us to be just saying thank you, Lord, um, as we see what the law, the purpose of the law is uh, underneath the new covenant. So, anyway, some good stuff today. Um, it's really good to be able to walk through. Uh, scripture. So, anybody else have anything before we close the word? Just remember, Jesus is the only one that could fulfill the law. Amen. He's the only one that fulfilled the law, Amen. and He did fulfill the law. Amen. Amen. The law was.
was just given to the Israelites because of their sin. That's why God gave it to Moses to, so that they could, because until they knew what they were doing wrong, they couldn't be held accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jesus is the only one that He came and He fulfilled the law. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll close in prayer then. So, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for uh, just the heart of the Apostle Paul and just the passion that he has um, to be able to speak truth about the, the gospel, that, it, that the gospel is Christ and, and Christ alone. Uh, Father, we thank you for uh, just the, the gift of Christ in our lives, that you extend salvation to us through Christ. Um, we're thankful for that today. God, we just pray that the truths of your word would just um, penetrate our heart. Um, Father, and just cause us to be thankful and grateful um, for Christ in our lives. And Father, that they would stir us and motivate us to live a life that points towards you. And Father, we thank you for um, just the opportunity to be here today and to hear these truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.